Okay, welcome everyone to our board meeting of November 14, 2023, our Lake Spring Lake Watershed District meeting. And uh, our first order is a meeting to order in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic in which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Our next item is to see if there's any comment from anybody in the audience on an item that's not on the agenda or on the consent agenda. You can come forward. Not seeing anybody willing to come up here right now, so we'll move on to the approval of the agenda. Uh, I have a motion to any additions or corrections from any board member? Nothing? Staff? Any corrections? Nope. I ask for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Um, made by Manager Morkenberg, second by Manager. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Motion's carried. And now we're going to go to some old and new business. And the first item is going to be approval of a new CAC member. And Danielle, are you taking the lead on this? Yes. Okay. So we received an application from Anna Alsweiger for membership in the Citizen Advisory Committee. Anna is going to be graduating from the University of Minnesota in Sustainable system, Systems Management this fall. And she has been living in the district since 2020. We believe Anna Alsweiger's perspective, uh, fresh perspective and understanding of the complexities of conservation issues will be an asset to the Citizen Advisory Committee. Uh, Anna has provided a couple of words on her interest in the Citizen Advisory Committee to share with you. Okay, well, welcome. If you get a green light, then you can record it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, thank you for having me. Um, uh, as she said, I'm Anna. Um, I'm a student at the University of Minnesota. I'm almost done with school major. Um, <clears throat> and I discovered this opportunity, and I thought it would be a great way to start um, applying what I've learned. I think that what I've learned has been or is very relevant to what the Citizens Advisory Committee and the Carly watershed district um, aims to accomplish and so I think that it would be a great way to start um, just applying what I've what I've learned and start giving back to the community oh that's just wonderful we're sure appreciate that you're willing to serve and volunteer and um, I don't have any qu other questions anybody else Manager Morkenberg now I wanted to welcome you as well and uh, forward to see if you have any new ideas from, from your study and from studying uh, that you can discuss at the CAC and work with the, with the staff and the board managers and, and uh, so we can see how we can best work together to reach our goals. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? No? Well, thank you very much, and uh, we will certainly be looking forward to seeing what you bring to the CAC and back you know, ultimately to us. Thank you, Matt. So, managers, we need to vote to. Yes, I was going to get do that. Okay, so we need a motion to approve the appointment of Anna Oswiger to the district, the district's citizen advisory committee. So moved. Mo motion made by Manager Markenberg, seconded by Manager Burnett. Any discussion on the motion? No, I'm not seeing or hearing any. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried 4 0. Well, Anna. Okay. Uh, the next item of business here is to go over our programs and projects and from staff. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about our clean water cleanup event that was on October 28th. 
Uh, a couple of our managers were there. Uh, it was a great success. 33 participants. There might have been a couple more people were trickling in throughout. It was awesome to see. There was all ages from probably about two years. Um, we did not get a weight um, on the leaves raked up, but there was about 9.5 cubic yards of leaves raked, and these are going to soil tree nursery. The city picked up the leaves for us. Uh, and then we had prizes for fun little competitions, biggest leaf or best leaf pun. Uh, we also had a raffle uh, door prize, and we had prizes from local businesses that donated to the clean water cleanup. Uh, we've been hosting this event since 2014. It's been a couple years. It was awesome to bring this back this year, and it seemed like everyone had a lot of fun. Okay, on to our uh, drought status. You know, we've really been pulling out of this uh, severe drought, and now we're, um, we're identified as being in an abnormally. So um, our lake levels sort of reflect that, but this is kind of an um, interesting piece here is that, you know, last year at this time, um, we were still in almost a a full extreme drought, so um, hopefully this helps, uh, you know, lake levels moving into uh, 2024. So Prior Lake is at 9.13, a couple inches lower than it was that last board meeting. Last year at the same time, we were at 898.4. You know, that's almost three quarters of a foot lower than it is today. And uh, Spring Lake is um, the same level it was last year. Our uh, CART management uh, program has um, been into this fall. We completed trap netting in Spring and Upper Prior Lakes. The trap netting, our goal is to observe and um, trap young of year carp with this type of equipment. No young of year carp were found in spring and upper prior lake in our traps. Um, so that's good news, but you know, we still found young of year while electro fishing. So um, just interesting pieces to add to our data set and management techniques. We evaluated carp barriers and repaired the Fremont carp barrier. This one is along this creek that goes from Arctic Lake into Mud Bay in Upper Prior Lake where the barrier had shifted. This barrier is eight years old. Um, there are still some maintenance um, that we need to do, but that requires uh, no water. I uh, expanded on this topic in the workshop. I'm really happy to say that over the last seven years, uh, we've we've met at a, a goal on Upper Prior Lake of reducing the carp population to below 100 kilograms per hectare. This is a significant goal that we've uh, had tremendous support through board managers over the last oh, greater than eight years. Um, while this number is, um, you know, we're still going to uh, keep our management goals uh, to remove carp in future, but uh, we're going to look to refine this number and move our into maintenance. Um, in Spring Lake, our carp population estimate has uh, decreased. It's at 125 kilograms per hectare, where our goal is at 100. Um, so we'll continue to remove carp in Spring Lake. Our 2023 biobase surveys um, have been created. So a biobase survey uses uh, like a sonar unit 
boat, we circle around the lake, and we use software to map out plant area coverage. Area coverage is um, basically anywhere along the bottom of the lake where plants grow. In, this, in these maps, you'll see red to blue. Blue indicates that there are no plants growing and all the way up to red where plants have reached the surface. It has been discussed and uh, studied that lakes with 40% area coverage sustain uh, lake health and water quality. So part of our goal, uh, our goals at the district are to improve uh, plant diversity and frequency. So as you can see in our pictures here, in 2016, there were less, in the lower left corner, there were less plants. And toward, uh, in our survey from today, we had 32% plant coverage. And our graph shows you know, a steady increase in plants. And this is reflective of the water quality conditions in the lake. So Upper Prior Lake has also had a very significant increase in plants, resulting from many different uh, management practices and projects. On the left, uh, behind this graph, see there were less than 10% coverage of plants in 2014. In July of 2023, we surveyed uh, Upper Prior Lake around 60% plant area coverage, which is uh, greater than the goal, but we're still expecting plants to sort of equal, you know, find their space within the lake. Um, the water quality is very, is, has increased tremendously in Upper Prior Lake. Um, so hopefully these plants will help continue supporting our projects. Um, lower Prior Lake remains uh, steady. Um, this year was at plant area coverage. And this is sort of a good model uh, for a lake that has had good plant area coverage and continues to support good water quality. And uh, Fish Lake also has a good population of aquatic plants. In June of this year, we had 27% plant area. This number has uh, increased over the past several years, and so has the diversity of uh, some of the aquatic plants. Uh, Steve McComas will be presenting on the point intercept surveys, plant diversity, and uh, species richness, uh, later this winter. So uh, Spring Lake Association got an email uh, last month talking about caddis flies, which really grabbed my attention. It's really exciting to see uh, residents and uh, people acknowledging and noticing these flies that um, use silk to attach to substrates that they build little cases. These cases can be uh, just made out of silk, but oftentimes they use debris and s different uh, things in the water to sort of build their protective shells. Caddis flies are um, considered biomonitoring organism, um, and they are an indicator of aquatic e ecosystem health. So they're quite sensitive to pollution and malocrine. They're many times associated with which um, Matt Tofanelli would really appreciate, but he's not here right now. Um, so, you know, s seeing these emerge and have them becoming more of, of a common, uh, you know, existence on 
in our lakes is a really good sign of our practice. Uh, seeing the biodiversity in insects, plants, and fish within our lakes is, is um, a telling sign that what we're doing is we're doing something right, and is improving. Um, really, really cool to see these types of indicators, and especially with our partners. So, uh, last part for the my chat here is going over historic ice observations. This graph goes over ice over dates. Um, so historically, our uh, ice over date um, typically falls in late November to early December. We'll be sending out an email to our uh, lake observation uh, volunteers to keep an eye out when the lake becomes greater than 90% uh, ice over. And then we use this data to track trends. We send it to the state who appreciates um, our long-term data sets. And so or the early dates were from 91 and November, not November 6th, 91, November 15th, 2014, and last year on the 21st. This, and then this trend line, you know, over time it's slightly going up, so suggesting that we might have shorter winters um, long term. You could sort of view this data differently on the short term it might be a little short term it would, it would suggest that it's ice over sooner so in the scheme of things it's not a super long data set but um, it is really interesting and uh, glad that we are uh, building these data sets so keep an eye on the lakes Great. I'm going to um, some projects here, a couple of the ongoing projects. Port seasons, so you'll be seeing a lot of them reviewing a lot of documents. So I tried to diversify here a little bit um, and new information. So the first uh, one to touch on is just to refresh your memory that we've got this system assessment of our ferric chloride uh, system kind of got this group of tasks that we're going to start with that are really focused at our system. I've highlighted driveway assessment because I have some new information to show you and uh, we're hoping to uh, get this uh, second, this first batch here of the maintaining and policing key system elements to get information, a draft report of that out this year or early next year. Um, just to keep things moving. The second kind of grouping in the green uh, will be more looking at um, effectiveness tweaks that we can do to um, make our system the best possible. Uh, and that'll be happening early next year because we had no flow this year. It was really hard to do the uh, studies that we needed to do. So, um, mind you, we're, we're trying to accomplish the basics this year and then our tweaks happening next year. Uh, the driveway assessment is focused on uh, reducing the damage that we're seeing in from current deliveries. This map shows the site where the deliveries happens. The, tr the trucks enter from this driveway. Uh, the area between the red line and the road is county right of way. And then the district holds an easement, this yellow hashed line, easement over the driveway. Uh, and then it enters another property and we hold an easement um, over that. So we, uh, the district met with the landowner just to their preferences. Overall, they expect, expressed a preference for as much pavement as we could budget and um, if we could include, include design elements that would minimize the appeal of turning around to do that. So um, you'll see in the draft report that we're looking at those things um, and possibilities of um, meeting them and the budget uh, implications of those. We'll also have in that draft report just recognizing which alternatives are within existing easement boundaries 
uh, ones would require additional easement. Uh, and then all of the alternatives were, are designed for accessibility. That is the main um, problem we're trying to solve here. Currently, the, the driveway uh, is too narrow and uh, causing damage to the, the driveway during delivery. So that is the problem we're trying to solve. These are some initial sketches of the two alternatives we presented to the landowner. Uh, alternative one essentially follows the delivery process that happens to date, where the truck pulls forward and then back from the highway with some uh, reinforced and widened driveway to allow for those curves. Uh, alternative two would be preferable in a safety manner. It pulls into the driveway and then backs up from the driveway. Uh, however, it's um, more widening and reinforcing, so will be a, a higher uh, cost to that. So these were the two alternatives uh, provided to the landowner, and we'll, you'll get more information of those coming in the draft report. I also wanted to just touch on, at the last meeting, the question, where are the cover crops happening, who's doing them, and what's uh, happening there? So I tried to pull together a summation here. Um, our reporting for 2023 is not this. The firmish numbers are coming from the last historical period, but in total, we had about a little bit of acres enrolled. It averages around 500 acres a year. Uh, and soil and water, I ask, does that mean that it's, we're adding each year, or is 500 acres in a year the number of cover crops that are there? Uh, and they said it's 500 acres that year. And um, I also asked because this is only encompassing the, pro the farms that enroll in all of our programs. Uh, how, what farms are doing this outside of our cost share program, outside of Farm Council? Uh, and heard that no, really, p if people are doing it, they're participating in the programs to get the incentives. So that's great to hear that got almost 100% participation, 100% of the people doing uh, cover cropping are uh, doing it because of our program or as part of our program. It averages out to about $60 a pound of phosphorus, so super effective. We've had 11 landowners participate in the past. Um, and then to give you an idea of what our goals be and how much cover crops uh, are across our district, and what we want to see over time. There's about 5,700 acres of cropland in the district. On any given year, it's around 8% of that land that is in cover crop. The nationwide average is 5%, and the Minnesota average is 7%. So relatively, we are doing well. Of course, we can always do better. So <laughs> uh, we're still promoting those programs, and um, you'll see in the next presentation that we're really looking to incentivize more adoption. I got a question. Is our 8% of the entire streak acreage, we have 8%? Yes. Yep. So if we were looking at that 2022 map, if we were just taking the area just south of Spring Lake, looks like to me we, our percentage would be pretty a lot higher. So yes, that's a good clarification. And the map of 2022 is all of the fields that have participated. So I should have put 2019 through 2022. Oh, That's okay. good clarification. They have participated. Yeah. Okay. So just showing that it has spread and different fields are trying it. Okay, got it. Yep. Good, good clarifying question. Uh, and then I said 2023 reporting is not complete, but it looks like we'll be around 4 acres this year. Uh, two new owners. And uh, we have a couple fields that are looking really great right now. So if uh, people are interested, I'll be sending out a map with those locations they're ready to see along the road. Uh, so I'll send that to um, you all, and you can drive by and see what cover cropping looks like if you're interested. That's coming. Manager Morgenberg. Yes, thank you so much for, for uh, that report. And uh, 
I think if you speak to farmers, that is one of the uh, best farming practices that they feel is the the best for them, and, and you know, the probably the easier one to do, and 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 uh, and very beneficial. So, the more we can encourage that and, and support the farmers in doing these best practices, the better it is. So, I think we should. It's good to hear percent. Nice to mm -hmm. do even better if they are interested. And ask the farmers. And like I'm going to the soil and water conservation district board meeting. Mm -hmm. On Thursday, I think I will ask them, how do you, and their uh, chairman has been one of the people that have been quite engaged in mm -hmm. himself, you know, done a great effort. Yep. Thank you. Manager Boyle. Um, I'm confused. So we, we talk about 500 acres a year, 19 through 22, and 400 this year, but with new landowners so that presumes we lost some landowners too or they mm. don't do cover crops every year they they no, don't necessarily all every year do all of the same acreage every year so the reduced acreage is likely because there's one big farmer who is taking a year off on his rotation so I got you mm -hmm. it's not an every year every year for every farmer once they're in they're in forever not no year to year yep okay Yep. Thank you. And the two new landowners is an addition to the landowners we've had before. I don't know that exact number of the return customers, but we'll get that information. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on that, oh. Yep. Are you going to cost share? This is not separate from that. Separate? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so just wanted to update on the cost share projects that have been approved in 2023. This schematic kind of, I wanted to outline the um, and just illuminate that uh, on the left, we start in rank. So I meet with or quarterly. Uh, we look at what projects are available and what landowners are willing, and then we rank them based on what their water quality benefit is. And if there are other funding sources available, we'll try and leverage and get the biggest higher priority projects done first if there's leftover. Um, then we would go for the project with less water quality benefit. So I just wanted to show you how that that plays out. Um, if it's a high priority project, I can approve that project in the prioritization. Uh, its numbers are uh, the cost for phosphorus is high enough that it meets thresholds. So those are types of practices for crops, shoreline restoration erosion cropland conversion to native prairie, gully erosion, et cetera. And then those go forward to implement uh, because those are already priorities for us. They're meeting our goals really efficiently. The, the cost per phosphorus is great. Um, and then there's this other lane at the bottom where the lower priority projects also tend to be lower, much lower cost, rain garden, prescribed burns, pollinator strips, all great projects, um, but just don't have a dollar per pound of phosphorus that those ones would. Um, so I just wanted to illuminate that, that um, the way that we do in this program is that it, we report after a project is complete. So uh, throughout the year, I bring projects to you to approve, and all you're seeing is kind of the lowest ranking projects, the smallest amounts only the ones you need to approve. So I just wanted to mention the projects that we have approved that are high priority. They haven't necessarily been completed yet, but this is what was is um, been prioritized in our batcher. So we will be reporting on them when we get when we get the uh, outcomes from them. We'll have two conservation cover projects, which is essentially converting turf to native prairie. One tree shrub establishment, two well decommissions, three shoreline restoration or erosion, two gully erosion, and one cover crop. So just didn't, I felt like the uh, view of this program was not reflective of what was happening behind the scenes, and I wanted to let you know that these are all planned and have been prioritized. And I believe that's all for the projects and programs. 
action. All right, good reporting. Any question, Frank? Can we go back to the first one? Yes. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, this one right here. Is that a cooperative project or is it solely a good project? Uh, it is the, the water driveway, the access, et cetera. Yeah, it's the watershed district's responsibility to maintain that access. So we work in cooperation to, because it's best practice and neighborly with the landowners, but it would be the, the watershed district. Thank financial you. responsibility as I understand it. Okay, follow-up question. Has the property owner seen the alternatives? Yes, they have. Do they have a preference? Didn't, it sounded like they wanted to see more information about uh, how much a easement okay. uh, would be for that further. The pulling in option would uh, require additional easement and so. Yeah, it's like alternative Two is the better one. Yeah, for safety of driving, it is uh, budgetary wise. It is it'll be more expensive. So. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions from board members? Okay. Emily, I think you're still up with the cost share docket revisions. Which it's a discussion only. Yep. Oh, just go back one. There's no vote on this. Not yet, anyway. Correct. So I'm just going to give you some changes we expect to see 24 on the cost share docket and um, some why behind that. Uh, to give you a brief primer to uh, review of the docket is the document that kind of uh, gives the policy and um, governs the cost share program. This right side, the general program policy is the first part of the document. That language is broadly applied to all of these organizations with logos up. So we've all been working together to make um, recommendations that would be uh, just broadly applicable to all of, all of the conservation organizations. Uh, it sets cost share rates and requirements or maximums and then contract terms. And then at the end, which I've got the arrow pointing to on the left side, uh, we have an appendix which has specific provisions to the watershed district. So we get to set our priorities and our approval processes and then any distinctions from the policy. So I'll kind of talk about expected revisions in each of those sections because they represent kind of different types of changes. And then just to uh, let you know how that works when we're updating with all of these different organizations, uh, we can uh, adopt on our own timeline. We've typically done that in the beginning of the year with uh, adopting master services agreement with soil and water. Uh, and if we were to adopt a version where we wanted to see different language did than another agency adopted, we would just include that in our specific prov provisions. Uh, to us because it is only applied to us. Uh, so that would be, we don't uh, need to be on the same schedule as everyone and that's how others function as well. So you can expect to see that that in early next year that we'll be adopting this. Uh, so some revisions to the general policy. I'll go pretty quick because they're <laughs> basic, but wording clarification, there's some adjustments just to reflect how the conservation practice gets implemented. Uh, some of those practices have had increased market values that we need to stay competitive with. Um, we are also want some language. The way the, the program functions now, soil and water offers some services like seeding, cover crop for farmers. The way it works right now, the farmer has to increase soil and water for that, then they get reimbursed, and then they submit again for um, their cost share incentives. So it goes, it zigzags back and forth. Uh, they'd be looking at just subtracting service, cost of those services from the incentive someone would receive. So one direction 
payment <laughs> uh, streamlining administration. We also want to think about how we can include language or rates for larger projects. For example, uh, we've been approached by a lake association who wants to do a shoreline restoration. Our shoreline restoration limits are based on an individual landowner. This shoreline uh, is 400 homes, so it's a larger property. Do we want to do a larger project and increase that rate for those big areas um, that seem to align with district priorities? Uh, so you might see some proposed language for that. Uh, and then lastly, cover crops. We really wanted to incentivize this practice. So we have now um, proposed that new adopters for their first 300 acres would receive a higher rate to kind of get people in the door, get new people in the door. Uh, and then we want to um, limit total cost share support on an applicant. So the same person can't come back and receive cost share funding on the same acreage for cover crop if they've adopted it and it's regular practice there's going they've we've proposed a maximum that we can support them doing that uh, and that's just to reflect that once people have adopted this practice and gotten the kinks out um, they're likely to continue it on their own and not require our funding so those are some proposed revisions to the general policy I'm going to pause if there are any questions on that portion. <coughs> uh, no, it, a comment. It seems like a lot of revisions, good revisions. Mm -hmm. For do we, Now, I know we have the opportunity to change every year, right? It's not yes, every annually. five years. So, um, so it looks like we're doing some changes. For, I like the incentive things. I think those are good that we put those in so that we can get more people involved. Any questions? Uh, Manager Boyles. Just a question. Do we ultimately approve these changes for, yes. for us? And then the same thing happens for each entity that's to them. Thank you. Yep. Correct. And would these changes, would they be in the appendix just for us? Or? Yes, they would. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then um, some expected revisions from specific watershed district. There's some just old language inaccuracies that have been held over that we want to clean up. Uh, previously, we had a limit at 7,500. Any project above that would immediately come to the board, no matter how highly it was ranked. Uh, we'd propose to raise that to 10,000. That hasn't been updated for uh, as long as anyone at the table could remember uh, to stay uh, current to the intent of that 